Then again, all living beings sustain life through the things they eat. Namo Mielet and Geikyo. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your support. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It's our Bodhisattva way to increase uh, our reach, our Sangha. Yeah. So thank you for your practice. There are many kinds of food. Some beings feed on dirt. Some feed on water. Some eat fire. And some eat wind. Obviously, we're continuing Nitrin's dialogue or writing on King Rinda to a young man, the son of another follower. And uh, Nitrin is still pointing out the profundity of the gift, the offering sent to him of rice and kelp or seaweed, dried seaweed and so forth, right? Um, impressing on this young man that the gesture of making an offering or, or helping somebody, especially in this case, the votary of the Lotus Sutra, has a very profound meaning. It isn't just, I'm going to help the guy out. An interesting thing to understand, and Nitrin is delving deeply into this cause-effect relationship within ourselves, right? So he continues, The insect called the Kalakula feeds on wind, while the creature called a mole feeds on dirt. Then there are some demons that eat human skin and flesh, bone and marrow, some that eat urine and dung, some that eat lives, and some that eat voices. So understand that this is storytelling, so give some latitude. Don't be analytical about these examples. But you can use the similes and see examples in our daily lives, right? There are fish that eat stones, and there is the baku beast that eats iron. And the deities of the earth the heavenly deities, the dragon deities, right? All of these, this folklore, this cultural knowledge. The deities of the sun and moon. The heavenly kings, Chakra and Brahma. The beings of the two vehicles, the bodhisattvas. And the Buddhas taste and savor the Buddhist law and make it their body and spirit. Now, there's a boatload of information in that. Not least of which is when he's talking about the sun and moon in the same breath as the Shravakas, Prachakabuddhas, Bodhisattvas, those dedicated students of Buddhism. When he says they make the Buddhist law their body and spirit, there their is... He's talking about energy and that energy manifesting, karma, energy with action, karma, being manifest, instantiated from potential, no differently between the sun, the moon, and you and me. No matter what our endeavors, whether we are planetoids, elements of the universe, or sentient, action-making, human sentient minds, we all share the law of instantiation from potential, the myoho renge kyo. It's, it's not clear that's what he's saying here, but... If you study and you understand Nichiren and Buddhism and Shakyamuni, that is exactly what he's saying. Let me give another example, he goes on. Once there was in the past a great ruler named King Rinda. Now we get to the, the topic of the title of this 
this letter. A worthy monarch who ruled over the entire land of Jampudvipa. He ruled over the world. Now, what was it that this king lived on? What sustained him? Right? It's not just about eating and food. What sustained this king? And presumably, because he introduced him as the king of the entire world, something had to motivate him, had to keep him doing whatever he was doing in order to hold that place of high honor, responsibility, etc. What sustained him? What motivated him? When he heard the sound of white horses neighing, his body would be nourished and thrive, and rested and serene in body and mind, he would rule over his kingdom. That was a very nurturing thing to him, very nourishing thing. Hearing these white horses, why white horses, I don't know, neighing in particular, but this was his inspiration. Again, this is a story, an example, yeah? This occurred in the same way that the creatures called frogs listen to the cries of their mothers and are thus enabled to grow. That the autumn bush clover blooms when it hears the crying of the deer. That the ivory plant puts forth buds when it hears the sound of thunder. Or that the pomegranate flourishes when it encounters a stone. This being the case, King Rinda had gathered together and kept in his care a number of white horses, as one would, right? What motivates one is what one tends to gather. It's a samsaric thing, yes? And because these white horses would neigh only when they caught sight of white swans, oh, the story thickens. He also gathered together a number of white swans, which he also kept in his care. Interesting. So this one thing greatly motivates King Rinda, and he recognizes that that thing that motivates him needs its own nurturing and care, nourishment. So he provides for that nourishment in a way to secure his nourishment. Hmm, wise. As a, as a result, not only did the king himself enjoy peace and tranquility, but the hundreds of officials and thousands of attendants who served him also prospered. Of course. Throughout the realm, the wind and rain came in their proper season, and other countries bowed their heads in submission. This situation continued for a number of years. But perhaps because of an error in his rule, or perhaps because the rewards accruing from his karma were exhausted, the thousands and ten thousands of white swans suddenly disappeared, and the countless white horses ceased to their neighing. And because the king could no longer hear the neighing of the white horses, he was like a flower that wilts or the moon in eclipse. His skin changed color, his strength waned away, his six sense organs grew dull and clouded, and he became like a senile old man. That's a little close to home. Careful. <laughs> The hundreds of officials and the thousands of attendants lamented, not knowing what to do. The skies clouded over, the earth trembled, great winds and droughts appeared, and famines and pestilence occurred, until so many persons had died that their flesh piled up in mounds and their bones were like heaps of tiles. Moreover, the country was beset by attacks from other nations. Ooh, methinks there's a, a really powerful analogy to what's occurring in Japan and 
in Nitrin's day, right? He takes this story of the sutras and the folklore and he relates them to current day events. Quite skillful. In case the story was losing this young man's attention, he brought it home. Yeah. Relate, yeah? At this time, the king, lamenting over what to do, concluded that the only recourse was to meditate, to, to plea with the Buddhas and deities. From times past, there had been believers in the non-Buddhist teachings in the kingdom, and they were numerous in many regions of the land. There were also many people who honored the teachings of the Buddha and regarded them as a treasure of the state. The king declared that he would honor the teachings of whichever group was successful at attracting the white swans and causing the white horses to neigh. First commanded the non-Buddhist believers to try the effectiveness of their teachings. But though they carried out their efforts over several days, not a single white swan appeared and the white horses failed to neigh. So, things like uh, prayer and pleading and all that stuff. It was wonderful ritual and spectacle, but it didn't achieve squat. The king ordered the non-Buddhists to cease their prayers and the Buddhists to make an attempt at their efforts. At that time, there was a young monk known as Bodhisattva Ashvagosha, right? a character that we've seen repeated throughout many writings and sutra. Bodhisattva Ashvagosha was also known as Horse Ney. How coincidental. When he summoned forth the king, he said, or summoned before the king, sorry, quote, if your majesty will ab uh, abolish the erroneous doctrines of the non-Buddhists throughout the kingdom and work to spread the teachings of the Buddha. It will be easy enough to make the horses neigh. Right? With your great wisdom and power, ruler of the world, decree that all of these erroneous doctrines and practices are erroneous and follow the one true way, the process of life, the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, or Buddha in general. The king issued an edict that this would be done. Okay, I'll do it. Then Bodhisattva Ashvagosha addressed his meditations to the Buddhas of the three existences and the ten directions, whereupon a white swan immediately appeared. When the white horses caught sight of the white swan, they whinnied in a single voice. No sooner had the king heard the single neigh of the horses that he opened his eyes. As two white swans and then hundreds, thousands of them appeared, the hundreds and thousands of white horses were instantly filled with joy and began neighing. The king's complexion was restored to its original state, like the sun re-emerging from an eclipse. And the strength of his body and the perspective powers of his mind, perceptive powers of his mind, became many hundreds and thousands of times greater than it had ever been before. The consort was overjoyed. The great ministers and High officials took courage. The common people pressed their palms together in reverence and the other countries bowed their heads. The situation in the world today, he continues, is no different from this. Take this personally. He's talking in grand terms of the nation and the world and so forth. But you are a nation. You are a world. I am a nation. I am a world. An old Buddhist once made this analogy to me and it, I've never forgotten it. This is exactly what Nietzsche is saying. As the world goes, as the universe goes, so do you. So do I. 
we are no different. We miss that point all the time. The situation in the world today is no different from this. The period during the seven reigns of the heavenly deities and the five reigns of the earthly deities, that is, the first 12 reigns in Japanese history, was like the kalpa of formation. When you were in the womb, like the kalpa of formation. The power of good fortune and the power derived from the keeping of the precepts that had been accumulated in previous existences or time were such that although the people of the time made no great effort toward goodness, the country was still well governed and people lived long lives. Think of this karmically, right? There are people, there humans born right now into desperate poverty, horrible situations, war, born in the midst of war, while others at the very same time are being born into comfort, luxury, security. It may be a hard pill to swallow, but the the births are no less magnificent in either case, but the karmic fallout that they are instantiated in predates them, right? Again, the birth is three. The mother, the father, and the entity that is born. They share karma, and they also are independent of one another. So this, this is built into this logic, yeah? If you want to know more about that, uh, uh, not sure how to search for it on this channel, but I've talked about it many times. Uh, I know I did a video specifically on this, so forgive me, I don't know what search words to use, but certainly birth would be a key word you could put into the search criteria on the homepage of the channel, yeah? Moving on. Then came a period of human sovereigns. During the first 29 reigns, the power derived from observing the precepts in the past existences began to weaken the corruption of thought, the daily activities of greed, anger, and foolishness, you know, samsara. Government affairs proceeded poorly, and for the first time the country was visited by the three calamities and seven disasters. But because the text describing how the three sovereigns and five emperors of antiquity had governed the world, were introduced from China. These could be used in paying honor to the deities and overcoming the calamities and disasters that beset the nation. This is the historic relationship between China and Japan, yes? The history, if you will. When Emperor Kimei, the 13th human sovereign, came to the throne... The power derived from good fortune and the observance of the precepts in the past had further weakened in the country. There appeared many people whose minds were dominated by negative, unaffirming, evil. Good minds were weakened and evil minds prevailed. The teachings of Confucian texts were so ineffectual and the weight of people's offenses was so great that as a result, the Confucian texts were abandoned entirely and people turned instead to the Buddhist scriptures. Okay. For example, Moriya paid honor to numerous deities who had appeared during the seven reigns of the heavenly deities and the five reigns of the earthly deities, praying that the Buddhist teachings would not spread and that the Confucian texts would be honored as they had before. 
uh, in Buddhist terms, that's evil because he's working against enlightenment. Right? That's our Western translation of good and evil. It's really not accurate, but we can use it as an example of, if we keep it in mind, that evil isn't some entity doing harm, which we tend to think in religious Western cultural terms, but evil is something that we do that gets in our way of seeing clearly our Buddha nature. Okay? Prince Shotoku, on the other hand, took Shakyamuni Buddha, the Lord of Teachings, as his, now here's this term again, object of devotion. How nonsensical does that verbiage sound? He took Shakyamuni Buddha, the Lord of Teachings, as his object of devotion. You see how that's, I need to do something about that. That's just so completely, wholly inaccurate. What is he trying to say? Objective might be a better word of determined practice, not devotion, right? He didn't fall to the feet of an object called Shakyamuni. How not Buddhist is that? He might as well be practicing some bizarre religion. That's just stupid. S-T-O-O-P-I-D. Stupid. <laughs> well, I blame the translator. Come on. Anyway, so Shotoku, he takes on Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings as the way to live life. Oh, much better. Reads much more sensically, yes? And adopted the Lotus Sutra, the Myoho Renge Kyo, and the other sutras as his teachings. The two parties vied for uh, supremacy, the non-Buddhists, the Confucianists, and the, the Buddhist via Shakyamuni Buddha. He's the one who established the teachings. How could it be any other? Hmm. But in the end, the deities were defeated. The Buddha emerged victorious, and just as had happened in India and in China, the land of the deities, for the first time, became a land of the Buddha. The passage in this sutra reads that, quote, Now this threefold world is all my domain, end quote, was in the process of being fulfilled. And again, not Shakyamuni's world, Buddha, world, Buddha, the mind, the Gohonzon, the Buddha awareness, the Buddha-ness rules the world. Of course it does, because everything is instantiated of this process from potential, the myoho renge the law, right? During the 20-some years from reign Emperor Kimei to Emperor Kamu, a period of 260 or more years, the Buddha was looked up to as the sovereign, and the deities were regarded as his ministers, in this way, the world was governed from the wisdom of Buddhist teaching, yes? But although the Buddhist teachings held a superior place and the deities an inferior one, the world was not well governed. People began to question why this should be so. And in the reign of Emperor Camus, there appeared a sage known as the great teacher Dengyo. who pondered over this problem. The deities have been defeated, and the Buddha has emerged victorious, he asserted. The Buddha is looked upon as the sovereign and the deities as his ministers. The relations between superior and inferior are correctly ordered in accordance with the rules of propriety, and therefore the nation should be well governed. How strange, then, that there is such unrest in the country. With this in mind, I began to examine all the sutras, and I realized 
that there is indeed a reason for such a state of affairs. Does this ring familiar? Dengyo took on the very same mission that Nichiren was now taking on. This has been done repeatedly from India to China to right, Tendai, Miaolo, Nagarjuna, over and over again throughout the history of Buddhism, there appear scholars who see what's happening clearly. No doubt because they are practicing the Buddhist teachings. It's just a matter of time, realization, awakening, before anyone who sets on the path to Buddhahood Whatever their disparities, wherever they're born in the world, whatever their ability to study, will gain the insights, gain the renge, as, they, as long as they're committed. That's the key. If you're seriously moving toward enlightenment, that that is your goal, then the teachings will support that and you will your path will become clear. Certainly, that's been proven over thousands of years in the scholarship of Buddhism itself. So here we are, Nichiren giving us yet another example of this. And no doubt, his example is a teaching to this young man of resolve and the effect you can't doubt will manifest because it's in the cause itself. Mm. Quote, The teachings of Buddhism have been guilty of a grave error. Among all the sutras, the Lotus Sutra ought to hold the position of sovereign, and the other sutras, such as the Flower Garland, Larger Wisdom, Profound Secrets, Agama Sutras, occupying the position of minister or attendant or common persons. And yet the Three Treatises School asserts that the Wisdom Sutras are superior to the Myoho Renge Kyo. The Dharma Characteristics School holds that the Profound Secret Sutra is superior to the Myoho Renge Kyo. And the Flower Garland School holds that the Flower Garland Sutra is superior to the Myoho Renge Kyo. While the Precept Schools proclaims itself the mother of all the other schools. There's not a single votary of the Lotus Sutra, the Myoho Renge Kyo, and those who do read and recite the Myoho Renge Kyo have been, contrary to all expectations, derided and dismissed by the people of the world. This is Dengyo. He proclaimed that because of this, the heavens are angered. And the benevolent deities who would have guarded the nation found their powers weakened. And he declared that even though people praise the Lotus Sutra, they destroy its heart. They're just playing at Buddhism. They're not really determined, resolved. Then the monks of the seven major temples of Nara, of the fifteen great temples, and of all the temples and mountain monasteries throughout the country of Japan, hearing these words, were greatly incensed. Who the hell is this guy, Dengyo, to say that we're not practicing Buddhism correctly? We're the authorities. Hmm, ego, arrogance, greed, power, hmm? Mahadeva of India and the Taoist priests of China have appeared in our country. Interloper, they exclaimed. They have taken on the form of this little monk known as Saicho, right, Dengyo. If anyone should encounter him, break his head in two and cut off his arms, beat him and curse him. Loud mouth. <laughs> Always this kind of reaction, right? Demonize, demonize, demonize. <laughs> Quite literally. 
But Emperor Camus, being a worthy ruler, inquired into, uh, into and clearly perceived the truth of the matter and concluded that the six schools of Nara were in error. This is a wise leader. For the first time, he established a temple on Mount Hiei, making it the headquarters of the Tendai Lotus School. And he not only founded an ordination platform for the precepts of perfect and immediate enlightenment, but declared the Lotus School to be superior to the six other schools, older schools, that is, connected with the seven major temples of Nara and the 15 temples. Ooh, I bet those others didn't like to hear that. In effect, the six schools came to be regarded as mere expedient teachings leading to the Lotus Sutra. Well, in fact, we know that. Pretty bold of Emperor Kamu, yeah? Who, you have to remember, an emperor is viewed by the people as not just a man, but a man imbued with the powers of the heavens, yes? In this case, the Buddhist deities, I guess, for lack of a better word. It was like the earlier instance in which the deities yield to the Buddha and became the doorkeepers of Buddhism. Something like the same situation prevailed in Japan. For the first time, it was made clear in this country that, as the sutra says, quote, among those sutras, the lotus is the foremost. And a person who is, is able to secretly expound the Lotus Sutra to one person, Bodhisattva effort, secretly, not because, blah, 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 blah. secretly because personal, intimate connection, is the envoy of the thus come one, of Buddha. It declares, and for the first time, such an envoy appeared in this country, the Dengyo. For a period of 20 or more years during the reigns of the three emperors Kamu, Heisei, and Saga, throughout the entire country of Japan, everyone was a practitioner of the Myoho Rengekyo. Yeah, it happened. Uh, but it didn't last, did it? We're going to end there. Suspense. I'll continue this story in the next. I hope you're enjoying this. I hope that you see that in Nietzsche's storytelling, again, I'm overwhelmed by Nietzsche's compassion here. He's managing to infuse a tremendous amount of Buddhist teaching in this very colorful, entertaining story, not least of which because he's talking to a young man. He knows that the young man's attention needs to be entertained, that the young man isn't a full scholar yet. He can't just go through facts and demonstrate logic. He has to bring him in to the story. And we all benefit from that kind of a teaching. That Nietzsche is flexing his bodhisattva. So I'm quite, I'm quite amazed at his chameleon-like uh, adeptness to shift his methodology, although he's accomplishing the same thing, to his listener. And isn't that the history of Buddhism? It's something we would do well to learn. Consider your audience when they ask you about Buddhism. Don't just hammer them over the head with the same information every time. They may need to hear it differently. They may need to be inspired into looking for themselves. Right? It's just like, uh, oops. It's just like um, this resource. The videos and the threefoldlotus.com website with answers and, and PDFs. These videos, the podcasts are just audio. There's bookstore, there's mandala store. I'm trying to provide as many avenues as I can for the curious mind. I can't answer everyone. I can't lead everyone. 
to their own insights because it's your practice that attains Buddhahood. And if you don't have any curiosity, if I try to feed every curiosity I can imagine, I'm really taking away from your determination. You must have some of your own curiosity to achieve your own insights. I'm putting it all there. There are playlists, right, on this channel where you can go look at specific books like the Lotus Sutra, Lotus Lectures. It's all about the Lotus Sutra, the, the Go Shows, so on and so forth. But you have to make the effort. You have to click on the buttons and look through the videos and start engaging with your study and your practice. There's only so much I can do or any of your friends can do, any of us can do. We have to maintain our conviction, our attitude of practice. That is the thing that is transmitted without words to engage others, inspire others. Yeah. Thank you for those efforts. They're invaluable. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Patrons, you guys are amazing, as I say over and over. However, you can support this resource, this channel, the entirety of what we're doing is greatly, greatly appreciated by all of us, right? Namo Myoto Geiko. Take care of your health. Be kind. And I'll see you in the next one. All right? Bye for now. Yo!